The Aztecs by Nigel Davies Chapter 5 A New Era Moctezuma died in 1468. After the elaborate funeral rites, his remains were buried within the precincts of his own palace in the very place where Hernán Cortés later built his residence in the new city of Mexico. His death marked the end of an epoch, and in the inner councils of Tenochtitlan the problem of succession loomed large. In spite of numerous natural offspring, Moctezuma left no legitimate sons. As the leaders assembled, all eyes were fixed on Tlacaelo. He first spoke in praise of the late ruler. Already you know the death of my brother, who, like one who carries a burden for a certain time, has borne the brunt of the lordship of Mexico till the end of his days. Fulfilling his duty like a slave, subject to his master's orders, protecting and defending all things which concern the realm. The same fate awaits me one day, and all who stand here, for life's joys, pleasures, and contents are only lent to us and last but a little while. You see already that all my brothers have ended their days, and I alone remain. Having thus spoken, he wept copiously. As might have been expected, by common accord, Laka El El was pressed to ascend his brother's throne. He, however, replied, What greater dominion can I have than what I hold and have already held. He was too old to begin to reign. If they could not themselves pick a fitting successor, they should call for the rulers of Texcoco and Tacuba, normally consulted on such occasions. The latter were accordingly summoned, and a long discussion followed behind closed doors. As the final outcome, Nasahua Coyot pointed a fateful finger towards a young prince named Aishyakat, meaning face of water. He was accordingly seated on the royal throne and dressed in the resplendent insignia of the Tlatoani. As was the custom, his first obligation was to listen to a series of lengthy addresses, after which all gave him magnificent gifts. Ashia Yakat was about 19 years old. He was the son of a prince named Desosomoktsin and thus the grandson of Moctezuma's predecessor. And not only was the new ruler young and untried, at the outset, Though he was later to prove himself, some doubted his capacities. His elder brothers, in particular, moved by jealousy, spoke disparagingly, suggesting that the only prisoners he could secure would be those purchased as slaves. The electors, however, a small but experienced body, knew better. Tlaka El El himself had numerous progeny and could surely have obtained the succession for one of his own sons. The election of Asha Yakat, whose father belonged to another branch of the royal family, in itself stressed the elective nature of the monarchy. It is not conceivable that Tlaka El El and Nesahua Coyot furthered the choice of a raw youth easy to control. Apparently, however, Tlaka El El died early in the new reign, thus enjoying, but for a brief span, the legendary prestige attaching to the only survivor of Moctezuma's one's generation. Accordingly, at this point, we must take our leave of this venerable soldier statesman. His continued existence seems improbable, notwithstanding certain chronicles which insist that he survived another quarter century, treating Asha Yakat and his two successors as insubordinate puppets, and living to the ripe old age of 120 years. It was perhaps better for Tlaka El El not to witness the last years of Asha Yakat and the reign of his successor, when the Machika were sent to, such, to suffer such ignominious defeats, unknown in his heyday. In 1472, Nesahua Coyote, the only survivor of that great triumvirate which had created the empire, also breathed his last. In the words of a poem attributed to his own pen, Just as a painting, our outlines will be dimmed. Just as a flower, we shall become desiccated. Ponder on this, eagle and tiger knights. Though you were carved in jade, though you were made of gold, you also will go thither, to the abode of the fleshless. We must all vanish, none may remain. The late ruler, at least, did not lack progeny, leaving sixty sons and fifty-seven daughters, descended from his forty wives. However, like Moctezuma, he had few legitimate heirs, and the throne accordingly passed to his son Nesahualpili aged only seven years. In Texcoco, the system of primogeniture was more firmly established, 
and a throne would pass to a son rather than to a brother or cousin. Nesahuacoyot, before dying, cha charged his three principal natural sons to protect and obey the infant Nesahuapili, making the eldest regent and foster father of the boy. Hardly were the funeral rites over, however, before these three began to plot against the legitimate heir with the intention of supplanting him. Ashayakat and the ruler of Takuba rushed to the rescue of Nesahualpili, bearing him to the safety of Tenochtitlan. They had, of course, been party to his election, as was the customary among the rulers of the Triple Alliance. This intervention on the part of Tenochtitlan to protect the infant heir of Texcoco suggests a growing Mexica influence in Texcocan affairs, even if Nesahualpili himself came to enjoy a position of authority within the alliance as a genial statesman. The young Nesahuapili was set upon a sumptuous throne and crowned as the ruler of Texcoco. The ceremonies apparently took place in Tenochtitlan, also a point of some significance. The three loyal brothers, the, the three disloyal brothers were saddened but went unpunished. They were even rewarded for their misdemeanors with palaces and provinces. Ashayakat himself spent some time in Texcoco, compelled personally to watch over the kingdom and its ruler's greedy relatives. Ashayakat must have been struck with dread when Nesahuacoyot pointed his gnarled finger, thus elevating him to the throne of the world and the seat of Huitzilopochtli. He was succeeding to a position occupied for 42 years, or as long as men could remember, by two August monarchs. Both were famed for valor and renown even before they ruled. Between them, they had transformed a modest heritage into a mighty realm. Ashayakat himself was deeply conscious of the legacy of, of the great departed ones, as these verses, attributed to the young ruler, clearly testify. People never cease to take their leave. All depart, the princes, the lords, and the nobles. Will leave us as orphans. Rejoice not, my lords. Perchance may any one return. May any come back from the abode of the fleshless. Will they come back to tell us something? Moctezuma, Nesahuacoyot, Toto. No, they will leave us as orphans. Be full of grief, O my lords. And now a mere fledgling, and, and now a mere fledgling had received the awesome summons to fulfill the supreme imperial role, and to follow worthily in the footsteps of the founding fathers. For the Tlatoani of Tenochtitlan, though no absolute monarch, was called upon to rule and to command. However powerful his generals. However wise his counselors, he was now set far above them. He, not they, wore the royal diadem and the blue robe of Huitzilopochtli. He alone was the successor of the king of Tula, the plume serpent, soon to return, attired as a Spanish knight. It was customary that a new ruler should conduct a campaign in the early days after his accession to prove his valor. Ashayakat apparently undertook his first major expedition in 1470 to suppress a rebellion in the Kotashla region to the southeast, already once conquered and reconquered by his great predecessor. This province was always intractable and was to rebel again in the following reigns. Owing to the very nature of the empire, lacking adequate regional organiz organization to ensure central control, it often fell to the ruler's lot before seeking new triumphs to reassert his sway over areas previously conquered. But Ashayakat's greatest test of strength or weakness came only in 1473, when a dispute erupted between Tenochtitlan and her sister city of Tlatelolco. The latter was not merely a twin township, but an indispensable partner on whose prowess Tenochtitlan, if not the whole Aztec realm, depended. Tlatelolco, perhaps the earlier of the two to develop, had fought many a campaign. Above all, however, it was the commercial capital of the empire in the sight of its principal market. Commerce, important in itself in any community, in the Aztec polity was inextricably linked with war. The, the Tlatelolco traders were blazing a trail into lands far beyond the present bounds of empire. It was consequently their forays which formed the basis of future conquest, apart from the wealth they offered. In very general terms, and leaving aside the role of Texcoco, the empire was based upon the joint enterprise of the warriors of Tenochtitlan and the merchants of Tlatelolco, though we must not forget that Tlatelolco also had warriors and Tenochtitlan traders. 
In spite of such interdependence, each was ruled by its own dynasty, installed a century ago after the settling of the two cities by the Mexica tribes. Since the ostensible origins of, of this quarrel are superficial, it may be fitting to seek deeper causes of discord. Of the two causes officially given, the more trivial may be first mentioned. Certain Tlatelolcan maidens yielded to the blandishments of some youths of Tenochtitlan. After readily allowing themselves to be ravished, they went and complained to their fathers. Following this incident, hardly meriting a resort to arms, the Tlatelolcans prepared for war. The ruler of Tlatelolco, Mokihish, had ascended his throne some years before Asha Yakat. As the dispute gathered force, his advisors were quick to warn him that they could not hope to defeat their fellow Mexica of Tenochtitlan without the help of allies. In his search for support, his success in the Valley of Mexico was limited. Farther afield, his hopes of victory were discounted and his pleas ignored. Meanwhile, Asha Yakat also prepared for war, summoning his subjects and allies. In the main, they proved loyal, in particular Texcoco. The adherence of the latter to his cause was crucial to the outcome. Another more convincing reason is, giving for the falling, is given for the falling out between the two cities, taking the form of a personal dispute between their two rulers. Mokiwish of Tlatelolco had married the sister of Asha Yakat, but he had long since wearied of a wife who had grown ugly, skinny, rattled, and fleshless. In fact, Mokihish had conceived such a hatred for his legitimate spouse that he would take away the cotton clothing provided by her brother Asha Yakat and give it to his concubines, leaving her with one tattered mantle. She was obliged to, sl to sleep in a corner by the wall, abandoned by her husband, who preferred the company of his other bedfellows, among whom some great beauties were to be found. Asha Yakat, enraged by the treatment of his sister, was heard to remark that Mokihish's concubines would bring upon this would bring destruction upon Tlatelolco. In addition, Mokihish was nagged at by his wife. In this respect, at least she, she, she showed prescience, begging him not to try conclusions with her brother and warning that such a venture would end in ruin. Mokihish, however, turned a deaf ear to these, to these entreaties and continued with his plans, undismayed by evil omens. One day he visited the kitchens of his palace and he was horror-struck to see some birds dancing as if alive in the pot in which they were being boiled. Asha Yakat's preparations were by now complete, and he made the following speech to the army leaders. Let not the fame and glory of such valiant men as yourselves be obscured, but guard and defend the realm and nation of Mexico. See where you have to fight. It is not so far distant, and you will not have to cross fords, bridges, rivers, mountains, nor deep ditches and defenses, since Tlatelolco is nearby and the way is flat. This must indeed have been a most comforting thought to his men, accustomed to the most arduous marches before reaching the scene of battle. In, instance, in this instance, their objective, the marketplace of Tlatelolco, lay about one mile distant. Asha Yakat sent word to Mokiwish of his impending attack, together with the ritual feather, sword, and shield, reluctant to be accused of taking his enemy unawares. Surprise attacks were occasionally employed against distant foes, but would have appeared ungentlemanly in a civil war among the Mechica. Then, after some preliminary fighting, he sent a second messenger to Mokiwish, whom the latter simply strangled. Ashayakat, still a very young man, had previously tended to display the more timid side of his nature, but now gave proof of the greatest vigor and courage, and personally led his forces to victory over the Tlatelolcans. The latter had eventually taken the offensive and advanced towards Tenochtitlan, but Ashayakat made a counter-thrust, forcing them to retreat past a point now occupied by the fine church of Santo Domingo, and pursuing them as far as Santa Ana, which also still exists, close to the main square of Tlatelolco. They were then besieged in the market itself. The Tlatelolcans, by now in desperate straits, proceeded to adopt the oddest of ruses. They dispatched squadrons of naked women against their enemies. They actually squeezed the milk from their bare breasts and sprinkled it over the opposing forces. To complete the effect, they were accompanied by another force, composed of a troop of young boys also naked except for the feathers on their heads. Asha Yakat, whose soldiers were apparently unnerved by these peculiar tactics, ordered that they should not be harmed, but simply made prisoners. Once this secret weapon had failed, Mokiwish saw that all was lost. 
Accompanied by his favorite dwarf, he mounted the steps of the main temple of Platalolco, fighting a brave rearguard action. The forces of Ashayakat, however, stormed the pyramid and threw him down from the top, together with the dwarf and many leading Platalolcans. The elders came and sued for peace, promising to serve Ashayakat, who therefore ordered that the fighting should cease. The Tlatelolcans now declared that they were mere merchants and could offer the fruits of their labors as tribute, in the form of the goods obtained from the remote ports, including the luxuries deemed so necessary by rulers and warriors. Ashayakat accepted the offer, but without losing sight of more pedestrian necessities, insisting that Tlatelolco should also provide biscuits and beans as wartime rations, as well as porters to convey them to the scene of battle. They must in future also furnish slaves for sacrifice and surrender much of their land. As a punishment, menial tasks such as sweeping out the, the places of Tenoch, the palaces of Tenochtitlan were imposed. As an additional humiliation, they would have no temple of their own dedicated to Huitzilopochtli. Such provisions constitute an angry reaction against the act of civil war, and apparently they were not enforced for long. For for Tlatelolco was a structural part of the Mexica community. Their temple of Huitzilopochtli was certainly restored and functioning when visited by Cortes 46 years later. But it was the end of Tlatelolco's independence. The dynasty disappeared and the city was henceforth ruled by a high-ranking official acting as military governor. Temporarily, however, Tlatelolco was harshly treated. At Ashayakat's command, the town was sacked, the victorious soldiers even robbing the kitchenware from the houses. Some Tlatelolcan women plunged into lagoon for refuge until the water reached to their necks. Ashayakat soldiers, finding these women thus submerged, amused themselves by forcing them to make noises in imitation of ducks and other aquatic birds in return for the privilege of being allowed to emerge from the water. One may be willing to accept that a dynastic feud, exacerbated by the spurning of Ashayakat's sister, could have played its part in the quarrel between the two Mexica cities. It may also be the case that Mokiwish resented claims to supremacy on the part of Tenochtitlan once the August Moctezuma had been succeeded by his own seemingly insignificant brother-in-law. However, such considerations are hardly sufficient in themselves to account for the sudden falling outs between close partners so dependent on each other. The Machica cities had always shown a remarkable pol political wisdom in their dealings both with one another and with their neighbors. A civil war with the Machica family could easily run asunder the whole fabric of the empire if their triple alliance partners and their subject peoples had taken different sides. Fortunately, almost all adhered to Tenochtitlan. The civil war was thus short of duration and its effects limited. One is, however, still left wondering why this war had to happen. A certain degree of rivalry had indeed persisted between the two cities, but until this fatal moment they had worked together, settling any differences by peaceful means. Latalolco, perhaps the more important in early days, had become the leading trading center of Middle America, just as the Nochtitlan had risen to the rank of foremost military power. Moreover, Latalolcan armies had played their part in many campaigns, actually making their own conquests. Latalolco's greatness as a commercial center cannot be overstressed. Furthermore, the Latalolcans operated not as mere private traders, but were an integral cog in the state machine paving the way to many a conquest. In fact, the military activities of their merchants may indirectly have cost the Tlatelolcans their independence. Even if Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco had worked together as equal partners in political matters, some kind of joint military command was clearly indispensable, as conquests were made in parts even, remote, even more re remote from the capital, the need increased for spying and scouting by the merchants. Such activities could only bear fruit if the latter's activities were geared to military policy directed primarily by Tenochtitlan. As long as Moctezuma ruled in Tenochtitlan, it was perhaps not too hard for a man of vast prestige to exercise primacy in such a partnership. The Tlatelolcans were perhaps prepared to, to do Moctezuma's bidding in most instances. However, with the advent of a young and untried ruler in Tenochtitlan, this might have changed. Owing, however, to the increasing military significance of the, of the Tlatelolco merchants, now blazing a trail in advance of the armies toward distant Guatemala, their activities had become one aspect of a joint enterprise, part trade, part conquest. The need thus became more pressing to bring the two, the two cities, still ruled by separate dynasties, under one control. 
In the long run, the empire required one ruler and one capital city. The war against Latelolco within the war against Latelolco and the graduate and the gradual, excuse me, decline in the status of Texcoco within the alliance were part of the same process. In view of the importance of commerce in all ancient Mexico, and not only among the Aztecs, some general comments are perhaps called on for the merchants of Tlatelolco and their neighbors. Of the great market of Tlatelolco, to be seen by the Spaniards 46 years later, the conquistador Bernal Diaz de, Cas de Castillo gives us a wonderful description. The chiefs who accompanied us showed us how each kind of merchant was kept separate and had its place marked out. Let us start with the dealers in gold, silver, and precious stones, feathers, cloth, and embroidered goods, and other merchandise in the form of men and women to be sold as slaves. There were as many here as the Negroes brought from Guinea by the Portuguese. Some were tied to long poles with collars around their necks so they couldn't escape, and others were left free. Then there were merchants who sold homespun clothing, cotton and thread, and others who sold cacao, so that n so that one could see every sort of goods that is to be found in all New Spain set out the way it's done where I come, come from, Medina del, del Campo, during fair time. There were people who sold henequen cloth as well as rope and shoes made from the same plant, and its cooked roots, which are very sweet, all in a special section of the market set aside for them. In another section they had skins of tigers, lions, deer, and other animals, some tanned and some not. Bernal Diaz goes on to describe the sellers of every kind of foodstuffs, turkeys and young dogs, as well as wild game and all sorts of vegetables and fruits. Like Cortez himself, he even noticed the many different kinds of honey which could be bought. After mentioning the sellers of tobacco, liquor, liquid amber and herbs, among the countless ver variety of wares on display, he makes shrewd observations about the means of exchange employed by the merchants. Then we went to the great coup or temple. And as we approached its great courts, there were many more merchants who sold golden grains as it came from the mines. They put it in goose quills, and since the quills were white, the gold could be seen through them. They calculated how much so many blankets or gourds of cacao were worth, or slaves, or whatever else they, they traded, according to the length and thickness of the quills. Both Bernal Diaz and Cortez mentioned the close government control exercised over the market, though on this point Cortez is the more explicit. There exists in the Great Square a large building like an audience hall, where 10 or 12 persons are always seated and who act as judges and who give sentence on all cases and questions arising in this market, and, whose order for punish and who order punishment for those who break the law. And in the same square there are other people who continuously walk among the people, observing what is sold and the measures with which it is measured, and we saw one measure broken which was false. This great market is not visible today in its full extent. On the other hand, Bernal Diaz also mentioned certain courtyards of great size, which he saw before reaching the main temple and also in the area surrounding this edifice. As a result of excavations around the site of the temple of Tlatelolco, the visitor nowadays can still gain a remote idea of what these patios must have been like. In addition, he can see the approximate point from which the ruler of Tlatelolco was cast down to his destruction though the actual pyramid now to be seen is prior to Monkey Wish and would by then have been covered by many superpositions. Of interest is the observant conquistador's mention of the means of exchange. The ancient Mexicans never evolved a single unit of exchange and goods were therefore sold by a form of barter using mainly cacao beans as well as cotton mantles known as cuashli and small flat t-shirt strips of copper. Quills filled with gold dust were also employed, though the chronicles, sharing the Spanish obsession for this metal, possibly overemphasized its use as currency, at the expense of other items serving the same purpose and in terms of whose value all merchants, including slaves, were priced. At the same time, it must be borne in mind that goods traded in the Tlatelolco market formed a limited part of the total activities of the merchant, whose operations are a unique feature of the Aztec world. Like so much else, this manner of doing business was not invented by the Mexica. The traders had probably not originated in the high plateau at all, but in the coastal regions, where there is evidence of long-distance trading in obsidian in the second millennium BC. Clearly, some kind of commerce existed between the Valley of Mexico and the far-off regions of Guatemala in the early centuries of our era. Moreover, Cholula 
one of the few cities with a continuous record of existence from early times until the conquest, was long preeminent as a great trading center. Probably the methods of those earlier traders were not so different. Since early times, trade has existed as a unifying factor. As such, the traders probably tended to dictate the pattern of military conquests rather than the reverse. From time to time, these highly itinerant merchants simply acquired new masters, the latest being the Aztecs. Possibly, moreover, under the latter, the organization became more complex and the merchants of Tlatelolco were certainly a hierarchized community. Having two principal chiefs and being divided into a number of clearly defined categories and ranks. As previously explained, a very special feature of these merchants was their combining of trade and war. The ruler used them as a kind of secret service to provide information on distant territories as yet unconquered. Like other spies or reconnaissance parties, they usually traveled at night, visiting not only imperial provinces but, but also regions described as enemy lands. They learned the local languages and went disguised, concealing their place of origin. If, dis if discovered, they were often slain. They faced conditions of the utmost austerity, living on dry tortillas and soggy maize. On such expeditions, the merchants of Tlatelolco were accompanied not only by those of Tenochtitlan, but also of other neighbors such as Chalco. Apart from acting as spies and reporting to the ruler information gleaned in foreign parts, they sometimes even became involved in major military operations. On an expedition to the Pacific coast, southeast of the port of Alcapulco, the Mexican export drive ran into fierce opposition, and the merchants were besieged for four years. They took their own prisoners in the fighting. And when war came to pass there at Ayotlan, the merchants, the vanguard merchants, were besieged for four years. At the time, the city yielded. At that time, they broke the rampart of Vigo and and Ocelot's warriors. And of all the and in all the devices, the Quetzal Feathercrest devices mentioned, all these dimensions assumed. In them they conquered, they completely vanquished the foe. And when the ruler of Awitotzin heard that the distinguished merchants were besieged there, then aid was sent. The one who was sent was Moctezuma, who was serving as who went serving as general. He had not at the time been installed as ruler. However, the efforts of the army commander and future sovereign, Moctezuma II, were, su were superfluous. When the relief expedition reached them, the merchants had already won the war and addressed Moctezuma as follows, O our lord, thou hast tired thyself, thou hast suffered fatigue, no longer needest thou reach the place whither thou goest, for it is already in the land of the master the portent Huisilopochtli. It may be worth noting that the merchants, who at home dressed more simply, wore when fighting the full warriors reg regalia. Since it was their custom not to cut their hair during an expedition, we are told that on this occasion it was reaching to their loins when they returned home. In spite of such forays, it would be a misconception to think of the merchants as mere warriors in, dis in disguise. They were equally vital to the economy, which probably depended on trade quite as much as on tribute. Their activities are described by Padre Sahagun, who devoted a whole book to his native informant's descriptions of the Tlatelolco merchants. Much of his investigations were carried out in Tlatelolco itself, and probably a few of those who described these expeditions had actually had actually participated as young men. But equally, where trade itself was concerned, the merchants acted strictly under the ages of the state which shared the benefits. The ruler may have addressed them as his beloved uncles. This, however, did not deter him, even after such ordeals, from relieving them of their luxury wares, such as turquoise mosaic shields, offering in return more modest trophies, such as bundles of rabbit fur capes. On their, major fur, on their major expeditions, the ruler would give them his own goods to trade. On certain occasions, he gave them 1,600 cotton capes, presumably received by him as tribute. These, in themselves a form of currency, were in their turn exchanged by the traders for luxuries adapted to the special predilections of the sovereigns of places to be visited. Such goods remained the exclusive property of the ruler. At the same time, however, the traders took with them their own merchandise including ornate articles of gold. 
on reaching their destination, they would do business in the first place with local rulers who offered the specialized produce of their own particular province or district. Owing to the problem of distance and transport, trade tended to base itself upon expensive items of small volume. As compensation for trading on the ruler's behalf, the merchants received important privileges. In certain provinces, only those acting under his protection might enter. They were thus in effect granted monopoly rights, often conceded only to the merchants of Tlatelolco and, Ten and Tenochtitlan, and excluding those of neighboring cities who partook in their expeditions. In addition to such operations beyond the boundaries of empire, they traded between the different imperial provinces, exchanging the, s the status symbols of one area for those of another. They would thus proceed southeastwards towards Toshtepec, a principal center where the Tlatelolcans had a protected base with special hostels for their own merchants and for those of other cities. From thence, they would divide, some continuing eastwards along the coast, exchanging their goods for the famous green stones of the region, while others made their way towards the Guatemalan border. Here, the local balance of payments depended on much, much on the sale of slaves. An odd situation thus prevailed whereby the Aztec ruler, not constant with the avalanche of tribute which poured into Tenochtitlan, would use his merchants to, to sell the tribute of one subject province for the free produce of another. And quite apart from the ruler's own property, the goods which the merchants themselves traded must also have been partly manufactured from raw materials obtained as tribute. Thus, by monopolistic commerce, the ruler multiplied his tribute sometimes even imposing unfair terms of trade on conquered provinces and selling them goods which they did not value. Long before the Europeans in Africa, the Aztecs discovered the advantages of supplying worthless baubles to the natives. The cities of Soconusco, near the Guatemalan border, were driven to oppose the Aztecs by force, weary of having their riches extracted each year in return for such dainties as cakes made from worms, cheeses of lagoon weeds, or simple toys and devices of little value, often in return for much prized cacao, gold, feathers, and precious stones. Thus the Aztec rulers, after imposing enormous tribute by armed force, took advantage of their military superiority to procure special conditions for their own traders. They thus exchanged these forced levies for an even greater quantities of goods for the rulers' own benefit. The lives of the merchants, like all Mexicans, were governed by long-established forms of ritual. They had to await a lucky day, such as one serpent or one monkey, before settling forth on an expedition. Equally, they could only come home on a day whose sign was propitious for this purpose. On their return, they faced endless ceremonies in honor of the gods, inclu including the merchant's own deity and the interminable speeches of welcome from their own chiefs. As a peculiar feature of their established customs, successful members of the fraternity were expected to give incredibly lavish banquets, entertaining the nobility, as well as their own colleagues. Their whole way of life presented a strange mixture of feigned humility and lavish display. On one hand, and as a symbolic form of humiliation, a chief merchant would accuse the returning traders of having simply stolen the merchandise which they had brought back. In addition, they were compelled to return to the house of a friend rather than to their own home, and unloaded their goods at night, actually pretending that these were not their property. When forced to fight, they wore full warrior's regalia, but at home they dressed in simpler attire. However rich in daily life, they, av they avoided ostentation. In contrast with this apparent modesty, they gave these Sardinapellian these feats, feasts, at which 100 turkeys and 40 dogs might be consumed. We are told that the two were served together with the dogs' meat underneath that of the turkey. The merchants were often referred to as bathers of slaves. The central features of the religious ceremonies following the banquets was the sacrifice of slaves who had previously been ritually bathed. These were brought in the local slave market. Since they were expected to play their due part in the rights of their own sacrifice, their price varied accordingly, 40 cotton capes being that for a slave killed in dancing, and only 30 for one less talented. After the gargantuan feasting, the priests would arrive and lead the slaves to the temple. Having been duly bathed and soothed with a drink of the sacred pulque, they were slain. At times they were even submitted to a form of gladiatorial sacrifice. 
The host of the banquet, as a gruesome relic of the occasion, would keep for the rest of his life the accoutrements of the victim, including his hair, in a sacred box made of reeds. It is an indication of the high status of the merchants that the sacrifice of their slaves was often allowed to coincide with the offering of war captives to Wisi Lapochli. The merchants formed a community apart, in many respects highly privileged. They were allowed to own land, and some could even send their children to the special schools reserved for the children of the ruling classes. The second Moctezuma even treated them as noblemen, bidding them to sit at his side on important occasions. They were, moreover, the only community in the state to have their own law courts. They differed from the normal concept of the merchant, not only because they were involved partly in state trading, quite apart from their military role, but also because the wealth acquired was devoted as much to banquets and display as to private accumulation. The reward for their great privations lay in riches used to impress through public display rather than to hoard for personal comfort. This tendency reveals a distinctive attitude towards success and riches in ancient Mexico, common also to other classes of society, of society as will later be seen. The merchants were certainly important, and it would seem that their status was increasing. It may be suspected that this trend gave rise to resentment on the part of the established ruling classes, hence their feigned humility and their tendency to hide their riches. When the Aztecs overthrew the Tepanecs in 1428, they naturally incorporated most of the tributaries of the vanquished into their newfound empire. But for, re for reasons not altogether clear, the region of the Valley of Toluca, that is to say the northwestern part of the empire of the Tepanecs and their probable place of origin, became once more independent. A pretext for conquest or reconquest was offered in 1474 by a family quarrel between two local rulers. War had broken out between Toluca and Tenancingo over the vital question as to who should pay tribute to whom. Needless to say, they both ended as Aztec tributaries. The ruler of Tenancingo appealed to the appealed to Asha Yakat for help, promising to become his loyal vassal. The latter was at this moment about to d dedicate an important sacrificial stone, an inauguration that necessitated a good supply of prisoners to grace the ceremony. The ruler's visit was therefore opportune, and messengers were promptly dispatched to Toluca with a request for pine and sandalwood, pleading an urgent need for these materials. The demand was rejected on the grounds that the Tolucans had no such wood in their mountains. Even today, however, in an era of relative deforestation, the traveler from Mexico City to Toluca passes through dense pine forests and can readily observe that neither ruler really needed more pine wood, but only an excuse for war. Sandalwood also is still plentiful in the region of Toluca, and in its colorful market, chairs and even spoons abound of this, made of this material. Ashayakat, in undertaking such an expedition, must have aimed to complete the conquest of the former Tepanec Empire and to dominate an area dangerously close to Tenochtitlan. Mexico City is only 40 miles distant from Toluca by road. He possibly feared that the inhabitants might ally themselves with the Tarascans, a formidable power lying beyond Toluca, and now to become the mortal enemies of the Aztecs. The usual preparations were made, including the mobilization of subject neighbors. Ashayakat and his army then set forth following desperate new appeals for help from Tenancingo. The forces of the latter were to attack Toluca from the surrounding mountains, whilst the Aztecs advanced along the road leading towards the city. Mindful of the need for victims for his new stone, the ruler gave the strictest instructions that his troops were to capture rather than kill. The Mexica themselves were placed in the van, occupying, as usual, the most dangerous position. Ashayakat still considered himself too young to address his veterans, and in order harangued the troops, reminding them that their adversaries were not tigers or eagles, but only men. In spite of his youth, the ruler showed himself to be worthy of his forebears. He told his main body to retreat to the near bank of a river which they had already crossed, thus drawing on the enemy. He himself awaited them in ambush with part of his force, who covered themselves with earth and branches. A serious snag, however, ensued. The enemy engaged in identical tactics, so popular in Mexican warfare. They too advanced, leaving a thousand men hiding among the bushes and agave plants. With both protagonists now intent upon ambushing the other, 
no initial battle could ensue. However, the Machika, as the more skilled in war, dissimulated the, the better, and finally the foe, provoked into advance, was taken from either flank and from the rear. Ashayaka himself rushed from his ambush and took several prisoners. The Aztec forces then pursued the enemy beyond the river and in their turn duly fell into their opponent's trap. The captain in command emerged from behind an agave plant and fell upon the, un the unwary Ashayakat, wounding him in the, in the thigh and almost cutting through to the bone. A hand fight ensued between the two until his captains came to the ruler's rescue. He ordered them to capture, not kill, his adversary, but the latter escaped. It was only by a hair's breadth that utter disaster was averted, and that the great Latoani himself avoided death on the sacrificial stone. Their cunning haven been of no avail, the enemy forces were routed, the ruler of Toluca prostrating himself before the wounded Ashayakat, now born in, now born in a litter. The lord of Tenancingo, as the cause of all the trouble, wept copiously and begged forgiveness. The future impost of tribute remained to be established. The Tolucans insisted that theirs was a poor country, offering no exotic tropical products but only maize, beans, amaranth, as well as pine and sandalwood, to burn in the hearth at night. There was great rejoicing at the ruler at the young ruler's safe return to Tenochtitlan after his escape from the jaws of death. Scouts were dispatched along the route to report on the arrival of the victors. Triumphal arches made of branches were erected, and the way was was thrown with foliage from Chapultepec, right up into the entrance into the city. As the army drew near, the priests surrounded their drums, and the sound was so overpowering that none present could hear himself speak. Bernal Diaz was to complain of the same deafening and continual roar during the last stages of the Spanish siege of the city. Safely home, Ashayakat first paid his respects to Huitzilopochtli, giving thanks for his delivery and, an and anointing the statue of the god with blood from his own thighs and ears. Once again, the unhappy prisoners were out of luck, since their arrival coincided with the feast of the flayed god, with its accompanying gladiatorial sacrifices as already described. The captives, dressed in the usual attire of the god to whom they were offered, followed each, each other to the sacrificial stone. Some preferred a quick death not even resisting the gladiators sent against them, the eagle and ocelot knights. Others vainly try to prolong their wretched lives, fighting the fully armed knights with weapons made of wood and feathers. As usual, great efforts have been made to impress neighboring people with Aztec splendor. On this occasion, invitations were extended to peoples from the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, not yet conquered at the time. These went accompanied by the threat of war, if not accepted. Such was the Aztec insistence that their grim ceremonies should not go unappreciated. These spectators at least suffered no discomfort, except perhaps a disquieting premonition that they might themselves one day serve as victims. They were placed in a special stand, decorated with flowers of every hue. They were seated upon soft and shining jaguar skins, and to protect them from the sun were given shades and fly whisks of rich plumes. It should perhaps be added that the cult of the flayed god was not altogether unknown to the people of the Valley of Toluca them, themselves, at least in the period immediately preceding the, the conquest. Not far away lies Malen, Malenalco, also conquered by Ashayakat, by Ashayakat, and where the principal temple is dedicated to the eagle and ocelot knights who performed the gladiatorial sacrifice. Part of a fresco was discovered portraying warriors, one of whom is attached with a rope, such as was used for victims of this particular form of sacrifice. It was apparently soon after this ceremony that another sacrificial stone was inaugurated, the famous Stone of the Sun. It first had to be taken to the top of the Temple of Huitzilopochtli, a somewhat artificial maneuver in itself since it weighed 24 tons. For its formal dedication, yet more prisoners were to be required. This monolith, traditionally known as the Aztec Calendar Stone, today occupies a central position in the National Museum of Anthropology. For, me for Mexico, it is no longer a mere monument, but a national symbol. In 1790, it was dug up in the main square, together with other important sculptures, and for many years was placed against the west tower of the cathedral. It remained there until, in 1885, General Porfirio Diaz, then President of Mexico, ordered its transfer to the original National Museum in Calle Moneda, 
whence it was moved to the new Mu Museum of Anthropology in 1964. The stone is important, not only for, for its aesthetic value, but because it's, it symbolizes the Aztec cosmos. It is dedicated to Tonatia as the, as the sun god, whose face is situated in the center. On either side of this are claws which clutch human hearts. The food of the sun god himself closely identified with Huitzilopochtli. The face and claws are covered with ornaments of jade, the precious stone of the gods. Surrounding the face of the sun god are reliefs in square panels representing the four previous creations of the world. These in turn are surrounded by the glyphs of the 20 day des designs of the ceremonial calendar. The creation and destruction of four successive worlds, curiously reminiscent of the parallel Greek myth of four creations, is based on the ever present Mexican principle of duality. In this instance, Duality is conceived in the form of an eternal struggle between the plume serpent Getzkoat, a basically beneficent god, though sometimes tempted into evil, and smoking mirror, Destatipoca, the dark and all-powerful lord of the night sky. The latter is a god greatly to be feared, but in some respects good as well as evil, a kind of creator destructor, recalling perhaps Vishnu Shiva of the Hindu pantheon. It was this personal struggle between the two gods that caused the destruction and creation of the four worlds or suns. These were successively destroyed by jaguars, symbolizing the earth, wind, rain, or in some versions fire, and water. These elements, symbolized by their respective gods, are represented in the four panels which surround the figure of the sun god, situated in the center part of the stone. After the destruction of these four worlds, the men who had peopled them were successively transformed and turned into jaguars, monkeys, birds, and fish. It might be worth n noting that the four elements involved, earth, air, fire, and water, are also basic to the beliefs of the peoples of East Asia. It is, however, to the fifth sun that the stone is dedicated, that which lit the Aztec world. The whole configuration of the central parts, inclu in including those elements already mentioned, is arranged to form the sign of four movement, that is to say, the glyph of the day on which the fifth sun was to end as a result of earthquakes. After the destruction of the fourth sun, it is told that when yet all was in darkness, when yet had no sun had shone and no dawn had broken, it is said, the gods gathered themselves together and took counsel among themselves there in Teotihuacan the great pyramid site not far from Mexico City that had flourished long before Aztec times. They spoke, they said among themselves, Come hither, O gods, who will carry the burden? Who will take it upon himself to be the sun, to bring the dawn? And upon this, one of them who was there spoke, Tecuzistecat presented himself. He said, O gods, I shall be the one. And again the gods spoke, And who else? Whereupon they looked around at one another. They pondered the matter. They said to one another, How may this be? How may we decide? No one dared. No one else came forward. Everyone was afraid. They all drew back. There was a present, however, a god called Nanawatzin, the little syphilitic god. As he stood listening, the gods called to him and said, Thou shalt be the one. He eagerly accepted the decision, saying, it is well, O gods, you have been good to me. Those chosen to become the sun and moon then did penance for four days and four nights, as did each Aztec ruler on his election. This rite they performed separately on two separate mounds. The latter became the Great Pyramids and are today still known traditionally as the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. Following this, the two gods were ritually dressed, and the remaining deities settled themselves around the Great Hearth in which the two were to be immolated. The little syphilitic god boldly cast himself into the flames while his companion hesitated and drew back four times before finally taking the plunge. He was naturally the last of the two to emerge. Then one of the gods came out running. With a rabbit he came to wound in the face of this tecoisistecat. With it he darkened his his face. He killed its, its brilliance. Thus doth it appear today. He thus became the moon, whose surface shadows reminded the ancient Mexicans of the rabbit. 
the gods who had thus emerged as the sun and moon still remained motionless and no dawn came. The solution was left to the wind god. Thus it became the charge of, e of Ehekat, the wind, who arose and exhorted himself fiercely and violently as he blew. At once he could move him, the sun, who thereupon went his way, and when he had already followed his course, only the moon remained there. At the time, when the sun came to enter the place where he set, then once more the moon moved. This legend of the successive worlds and of their destruction, as symbolized in the central part of the stone of the sun, lies at the very basis of Aztec thought and action. In their philosophy, this world was not a once and for all gift, but was equally doomed to be to destruction by the gods, who were cruel rather than beneficent. For the individual, as for the whole universe, life was an ephemeral gift. As they say, we do not dwell in truth, nor in truth do we come to tarry on earth. Oh, I must leave the gorgeous flowers, I must go down and seek what lies beyond. Oh, for a moment my heart grew weary, we are only granted, the beautiful songs as but a loan. The fifth world itself, in which the Aztecs lived, was a temporary concession, which the gods themselves would destroy if they were not amply nourished with sacrificial victims. To provide these was a bounden duty, not only to ensure the well-being of mankind, but also its survival. The stone itself was not as much a portent as a legend, portraying as its central motif not the sun's birthday, but its future day of doom. Through travail by the gods had this world been created. Through sacrifice by man would it be maintained, but only for a while. Life on this planet was thus imbued with the spirit of a, of a duty to be done. They performed this, knowing that in doing so they could only postpone the awful hour of doom. Little did they guess that, for their empire, the days were already numbered. Four years after the Tolucan campaign, another expedition was undertaken, aimed at further extension of the bounds of empire in the same direction. In the interval, Another war had been waged, resulting in the conquest of Tushpan on the Gulf Coast, north of Veracruz. This area, the heartland of the Huastecs, was previously invaded by Moctezuma I, but not fully subdued. Beyond the valley of Toluca, so recently absorbed, lay the land of the Tarascans, situated in what is now mainly the state of Michoacan, but stretching also into Querétaro and Guanajuato. Many Tarascan place names still survive, most, most notably those ending in Auto, such as Querétaro and Batscuaro. Tarascan origins are unknown, but according to legend, they arrived from the northwest at the same time as the Mexica, and tradition claims them as related tribes. At, at all events, the Tarascans arrived relatively late upon the scene. Like the Aztecs, they had formed a tripartite league of three cities, Batzcuaro, Tzintzuntan, and Il Ilhuatzo, all situated on the beautiful lake of Batzcuaro, now deservedly a tourist attraction. Their government was not unlike that of the Aztecs. Each center had one ruler whose role was religious as well as political, and who was supported by a whole apparatus of state officials and army commanders. Their principal deity was a kind of fire god a cult not unexpected in a region of, mulch, of much volcanic activity. These Tarascans were brave, though a trifle uncouth. Both men and women shaved their heads. They also depilated their bodies, using, this, using for this purpose met, metal pinchers. Those of the priests were made of gold. This detail is significant. The practical uses of metal, as opposed to mere ornaments, were more developed among the Tarascans than the Aztecs. In the long run, this must have affected war potential, Aztec implements being made of mere stone or wood. Had the Spaniards arrived half a century later, it has been suggested, they, m they might have encountered not the Aztecs, but the Tarascans. The latter, as the Aztecs were to discover for themselves, were formidable as, as warriors, whatever their aesthetic limitations. Their temples consisted of a curious kind of platform surmounted by a series of round towers. Such structures are known as yakatas, and a good example can be seen today at Tzintzuntan, the principal of their centers. As a preliminary move, the Aztecs took the town of Xiquipilco in 1478. 
This in itself was a hard-fought campaign. Many prisoners were taken, and the enemy ruler was killed by Ashayakat. In such an act of reprisal, he ran counter to, to custom, whereby local potentates were conciliated once victory was secured. It is not absolutely clear why Ashayakat decided to risk his luck against such a redoubtable foe. It may have been the recently subdued Tolukans who spurred him on. As a basic precept, the Aztecs believe in big battalions. This time, however, they were outnumbered from the start. We are told that their forces totaled 24,000, opposing 40,000 Tarascans. The latter, moreover, enjoyed interior lines of communication. This was no mere city-state, but a rival empire fighting for its very life and upon home ground. Before hostilities began, the Tarascans sent emissaries, as usual, numbering four, and who spoke Nahuatl. They sought to deter Ashayakat from the invasion, addressing him as follows. Great Lord, what has brought you hither? To what cause was your coming due? Were you not happy in your own land? Who deceived you into journeying hither? Was it perchance the Matlasinka, whom you destroyed not too long ago? Look to what you do, Lord, for you have been most ill-advised. Ashayakat informed of the huge force which the enemy had mustered, apparently had second thoughts about the whole campaign. He was even prepared to call it off, but finally let himself be persuaded by his captains that the offensive must go forward. After one day's battle, the enemy's fury was undiminished and the Aztecs began to retreat. Their leaders, in consternation, held a council of war. Their eyes, nose, and mouth were so coated with grime and sweat that they were barely recognizable. Their spirits were low, and to bolster them, they drank a potion called Yolat. The fighting was resumed the next day. The Aztec forces were divided, as usual, into separate contingents for each subject people. One after the other, they were thrown against the Tarascans to no avail. The latter captured many, including a close kinsman of Ashayakat, and one of his inner council of four. A discussion followed as to whether to abandon the struggle something the Invincible Empire had never before contemplated. The Chief General insisted that it was simply useless to commit more troops to be sent as lambs to be slaughtered. If you are still determined that, you, that we must all perish here, I will be the first to die, as the oldest among you. But if you feel that it is right that we should return in order to reform our forces in Mexico de Nochtitlan, then so let us do. He, rem he reminded them that the Jalco War had lasted for 13 years. If they could live to fight another day, fresh opportunities arose to overcome this new enemy would arise. The remnants of the army beat a hasty retreat, the Tarascans in hot pursuit, until they reached the safety of the mountains surrounding Toluca. In all, 20,000 had been lost, and only 200 of the actual Mexica contingent survived. Many of these were wounded. Ashayakat eventually reached the outskirts of Tenochtitlan with his pathetic little band to be greeted with weeping and lamentation. To mark his return, ceremonies were performed as if to Huitzilopochtli, whose likeness the ruler pers personified. The high priest offered consolation, saying that he had fought bravely and that by the deaths of so many warriors he had given sustenance to the gods. But no honeyed words from the lips of sycophants could sweeten the bitter pill. The mighty Aztecs had suffered a crushing defeat. The anguish of the ruler was surely intense at having proved unworthy of his forebears, and the fear must have persisted that such a humiliation would dissolve the loyalty of subjects, at the best of times apt to rebel against a control excised mainly from afar, by threat of retaliation. Moreover, the defeat left the empire exposed to a powerful foe on its flank, and no major attempt was ever made to reverse the verdict. In the northwest, there now existed a frontier problem, such as the more pliant peoples to the east and south had never offered. Conquests were later undertaken to buttress the border, and frontier cities were even, were even fortified as a partial protection against the menace. We know little of the events following the Tarascan War until Ashayakat's death in 1481 after a reign of 12 years. He was still a young man in his early 30s. Possibly death was hastened by the rigors of his campaigns and by wounds received. He had not been a great king, but at least a valiant one. As Map 4 shows, he expanded the empire in two principal directions, northwest to take the valley of Toluca and adjacent areas, and northeast 
to tighten his hold on the rich coastlands of the Gulf of Mexico. These were invaded but not fully subdued by Moctezuma I. In addition to the campaigns already described, he had also succeeded in extending his frontiers by making certain conquests to the south and southeast. Thus, in almost every direction, the Aztecs controlled more territory at his death than when he ascended the throne. Like those of other rulers, his efforts had been partly against places like Cotashla, already once conquered but which had rebelled against the heavy tribute. However, unlike his immediate forebears, he had also suffered a humiliating defeat. It says, more, it says much for the resilience of the Mexica that they could survive this failure as well as those of his short-lived successor, finally redeemed by the military genius of the next ruler. By that time, Aztec stock had much declined among certain neighboring cities, but the situation was still one which a forceful monarch could quickly restore. Moreover, however uncertain the loyalties of more remote provinces, the Aztecs had established a firm grip on the peoples of the Valley of Mexico and the surrounding country. Even in their hour of need, some of these at least were slow to join the bandwagon of the seemingly invincible Spaniards. It was the duty of the woman snake, Siwakwat, still the second in the land, even after the passing of the great Blaca El, to announce the young ruler's death. He first pronounced a long oration offering consolation to the leaders. He then gave similar addresses to warriors and priests. Nearby rulers were also officially informed, being moved to bitter tears at the news. Then followed a peculiar ceremony. The various rulers each brought four slaves, two male and two female, sumptuously adorned as funeral offerings. These princes, each in turn, addressed the Tlatoani's remains as if he were still alive, recalling above all his prowess and ardor in war. All those present were deeply moved. The ruler of Texcoco spoke first, as was his right. My son, most brave you and excellent ruler. My lord, Ashayakat, this is the last occasion on which I may see your face. Now you have arrived at the place where you shall find your feathers, your fathers, excuse me, and relatives, and enjoy the glory of the lord of creation, of the day and of the night, the air and the fire. I have brought this small gift to help you pass your time pleasurably in that world. With these words, he placed the four slaves and rich gifts before the body. The king of the third member of the alliance, Takuba, waxed even more eloquent, and the Machika were astounded at the excellence of his rhetoric. My son alone, defenseless and without consolation, have you left the realm and city of Mexico, dependent only on the will of the Lord of creation, this day or any other. Now you have laid down the burden forever, and the people will no longer enjoy the defense and, prote and protection which they were wont to seek in you. You have already arrived at the place of the great lords, your kinsfolk, and ancestors. Already you are resting in the shade of these dark meadows of the nine mouths of death, and in the house lit by the splendor of the sun, where are also your forebears. May your body now repose, my son. Many other rulers, including those of the Cuernavaca region, then presented their four slaves and their fine gifts, including, of course, jewels, feathers, gold, and cacao. They were followed by those of the independent states, such as Tlaxcala, often referred to as enemies, who had come to pay their respects. The woman snake particularly enjoined his subordinates to provide lavish hospitality for these enemies. The Aztec, craving to impress, seemed to increase as the empire expanded. The chief stewards ordered 600 turkeys as well as much wild game. The women of Xochimilco spent two whole days preparing delicacies for the visitors, who marveled at the largesse displayed and at the rich gifts offered. That they should not prove unworthy adversaries, the señores of the unconquered cities received gifts of arms in addition to other presents. A special building was now made ready after these orations addressed to the body of the dead ruler. In it was placed not the actual body, but a kind mortuary bundle or likeness made of chips of sandalwood. This was dressed in a series of fantastic garments representing the four principal gods. The first attire, of course, consisted of the robes of Huitzilopochtli himself, and the second represented those of the legendary Tlaloc, the, the rain god. These were the two gods whose shrine occupied the great temple. When dressed as the rain god, the figure was crowned with hair and plumes, holding in one hand a shield and in the other a staff shaped as lightning. 
characteristic of his deity. The third robe was of a god whose name literally means the one who drinks pulque in the night and who is to be identified with the flayed god. The fourth god, whose robes were placed upon the image, was the plumed servant Quetzalcoatl, the deity who had once appeared in the east and for whom Cortes was at first taken. When thus arrayed, the mortuary bundle wore a tiger mask with a bird's bill through which the deity, also god of wind, would blow to create turbulence. Professional mourners now came forth, singing dirges before the sumptuously arrayed bundle. It was then offered food, including all kinds of maize cake and jars of cacao. The principal lords filed past in due order, bearing flowers and sprinkling perfume over the figure representing their king. Next followed the slaves presented by the rulers, all regally clad. The jewel boxes of the defunct were then brought, and the slaves adorned with the gems which he had used. After this came his dwarfs and hunchbacks, also richly robed. The image was offered cups of pulque, which was left for the singers to drink. It was finally taken out and burned in front of the statue of Huitzilopochtli, together with the actual body of the ruler. As due preparation for the service of their master in the next world, the assembled hunchbacks and dwarves were addressed as follows. My sons, may you happily reach your lord Ashayakat in the other life, which, which awaits you with its rich gifts and with all the delights of the world. Take care not to lose those things that belong to your master, but bear them safely to him. They then sounded Ashayakat's great drum, cut out of the hearts of the dwarves and hunchbacks, causing them, casting them into the eagle vessel. The leading Mechica thanked the neighboring rulers for attending their master's funeral. The guests then fasted for 80 days before returning to Tenochtitlan for the final ceremonies. None failed to reappear. Following the death of Ashayakat, his elder brother Tisok was elected to rule in his stead. Like many Tlatoanis, he had previously been one of the two principal generals and had belonged to the ruler's inner council of four. As to the qualities sought by the small committee of, el of electors, they cast votes for all the princes who were sons of lords, men at arms, brave warriors, experienced in war, who shrank not from the enemy, who knew not wine, who were not drunkards, who became not stupefied, the prudent, able, wise, of sound and righteous rearing and upbringing, who spoke well and were obedient, benevolent, discreet, and intelligent. On other occasions, the rulers, select, the rulers selected have possessed such qualities in, ab in abundance. However, even the wisest can err, and this time the choice was unfortunate. As a consequence, an inglorious interlude in Mexica history ensued. Happily, its duration was short, and Tisok only reigned from 1481 to 1486. In spite of his military rank, as a, as a ruler, he showed more proclivity to the practice of religion than to the art of war. Among the initial ceremonies before Tisok's annual coronation, actual coronation, excuse me, was the ritual piercing of the nose and the insertion of a delicately fashioned green emerald. He was equally adorned with earplugs of emerald and gold. He mounted a throne, decorated with eagle feathers and padded with jaguar skins, known as the Eagle and Jaguar Throne. The significance of the Eagle and Jaguar Order of, of Knights will be explained in the following chapter. Next, he followed the prescribed rites of auto-sacrifice, drawing votive blood from, the, from, from his ears and thighs with a pointed jaguar bone, fitted with a handle of gold. The ruler of Texcoco made the following speech. Most mighty lord and brave youth, you have inherited the royal seat of very rich and fine feathers, and the hall of precious stones that the god Quetzalcoatl, the great Topitzin, and the wonderful and glorious Huitzilopochtli have left behind them. This royal throne is only lent to you, and not forever but for a short while only. The brave rulers who preceded you have exalted and extended this realm, more especially your grandfather Moctezuma, of high and revered memory, who in his long life raised it to a high pitch of glory such as it had never before attained. Therefore, my lord, take care not to be faint, not to be of faint heart. Look carefully to what you do. Take heed for the orphan and for the widow, for the aged who can work no longer, because these are the plumes, the eyelashes, and the eyebrows of Huitzilopochtli. 
Most especially, you must care for the eagles and tigers, those brave and valiant men, who act as a rampart of defense for you and the realm, and who extend its bounds by the shedding of their blood. With these words, my lord, I end my speech. Thereupon, according to the usual custom, followed many other addresses. The words of Nessa Huapili of Texcoco may seem to us formal and tedious, like most of these Aztec homilies. They are, however, worth quoting, since they illustrate the Aztec concept of the righteous ruler, for whom reigning was a duty, not a right. Nessa Huapili first refers to the divine nature of the office. Several rulers, including Tisok, had previously been priests as well as soldiers. The Tlatoani is the rep is representative not only of Huitzilopochtli, but also of other gods and heroes of Toltec times, to which the Aztecs look back to as a golden age. He is then rem reminded for the passing nature of his throne, being elected only for his lifetime, and of the glories of his forebears, whom he must emulate. He is next made aware of his dual calling, as protector of the toiling masses and master of the mighty warriors. The first role is most significant. Throughout Aztec history, we are conscious of the civic center sense of the ruler and of his obligations towards ordinary citizens. In spite of the aura surrounding the Latoani, his domains were no personal patrimony enjoyed by the divine right, but a charge to be held in trust. Whatever the faults of the system, the humbler classes throughout ancient Mexico always look to, to rulers duty bound to guard their rights and to care for their needs, a safeguard entirely lacking when they were handed over to the absentee Spanish warlords. Notwithstanding, the stirring speeches and the fine robes, the reign was not destined to be open in a blaze of glory. The formal coronation would have been incomplete unless accompanied by numerous offerings. It was a matter of custom and necessity that the new ruler should thus undertake a major campaign. This time the chosen victim was Mestitlan. This region lay in the northern extremity of the empire, as it then existed. It was later to be surrounded by Aztec territory, but remained one of those independent pockets never fully conquered. The local ruler possessed many subjects and towns, and even at the time of the conquest, after great Aztec's inroads, still controlled an extensive area. His subjects enjoyed a reputation as warriors. If they did not triumph on the first occasion, they would return to the fray day after day until their foe was crushed. On this particular occasion, no pretext was offered for war. The Aztec forces were mobilized and proceeded to assemble on the northern marches of empire. Tisok, who accompanied his army, then adopted a curious tactic, using only mercenaries from these northern provinces for the attack, while keeping them the main Aztec forces in reserve. The defenders had been reinforced by Huastecs from the Gulf Coast, old enemies of the Mexica, and still only partly conquered. The local levies, used as spearheads of the offensive, proved unequal to their task and were forced to retire. The main army was then thrown into battle, the actual Mechica contingent bringing up the rear. Some of the hardest fighting was carried out by a squadron of boys 18 to 20 years old, doubtless interspersed as usual, by seasoned warriors. They took 40 prisoners and drove the enemy back over the river bordering his territory. But in the course of fighting, the Aztecs had lost 300 men and thus for them the encounter was somewhat inglorious. At that point, the captains surrounded the retreat and the army withdrew. Apparently, the faint-hearted Tisok had already retired from the field of battle. The reception of the returning army, accompanied by its tiny band of prisoners, was a sad one. Notwithstanding their reduced numbers, the full sacrificial ritual was followed as part of the coronation ceremonies. These included a festive dance in which 200 lords and knights participated, dressed in glorious attire provided by the monarch. By this time, Nesahuapili of Texcoco was growing up. In spite of his accession at the tender age of seven, he managed to survive and grew into a young man of talent, second only to his father in accomplishment. During his long reign, Texcoco remained, if not an equal, at least a partner of Tenochtitlan rather than a mere vassal. Nesahuapili as a young man, reputedly longed to distinguish himself as a warrior, and he succeeded in obtaining his baptism of fire at an early age. According to these accounts, every day seemed to him a thousand years until he can prove himself on the battlefield. He daily practiced the use of arms and tried on his father's regalia, which he had no right to wear in public. Even rulers were not exempt from the laws limiting certain insignia exclusively to those who had taken prisoners. 
At this time, though hardly later in life, he practiced austerity and slept on the bare floor covered in coarse blankets. Apparently, however, even at this early age, his show of military ardor may have been somewhat feigned, and his elder brothers actually upbraided him for not going to the wars. They even said that Teshkoko had a ruler had as a ruler nothing but an effeminate boy who delighted in wearing the jewels and finery which they had won in battle. Nasahua Pili replied to, to these taunts, saying that he regretted b bitterly that he had been too young to fight before, but now he would participate in a campaign. In effect, he accompanied his army on an expedition to the Gulf Coast, taking among other places Oritaba. The city had been conquered before, but had evidently again rebelled against the payment of tribute. During Tisok's reign, he also participated in the other campaigns, particularly in the area between Teshkoko and the Caribbean coast, where Teshkokan influence was strong. Early in life, Nesahua Pili showed his talents as a master builder, reconst reconstructing his father's temples and palaces and amplifying the great gardens and waterworks begun in the previous reign. The, pro the prodigal luxury of the royal household increased. In the course of a year, the palace, including the countless officials, consumed 31,000 bushels of maize, 5,000 bushels of chile, 8,000 turkeys, and 574,000 mantles. Such quantities of produce derived mainly from tribute. Even our Teshkokan sources insist that this was originally div divided up in Tenochtitlan, another indication of the primacy of the latter. Of what he received, Nesahuapili, as a wise ruler, kept in reserve substantial amounts as a precaution against bad harvests. Nesahuapili was also a great lover. He is reported to have had 2,000 concubines, although only 40 bore him children. By his legitimate wife, a niece of Tisok, he had 11 offspring. But like many a, a monarch, he preferred the company of concubines. His favorite lady was called the Lady of Tula. Not because of her noble birth, for she was only a merchant's daughter, but because she was so erudite that she was the equal in intellect of the ruler and his sages. She was even an accomplished poetess. Such was her influence on Nesahua Pili that he would grant her all her wishes. Of Tisok's activities toward the end of his reign, little, little is known. Reportedly, he preferred to seclude himself in his palace, showing little interest in public affairs and even less in wars to enhance the glory of the Mechica. It is fair to add that he also showed his talents as a builder, and during his reign, a major enlargement of the Great Temple was initiated, only to be completed by his successor. Also, to commemorate this ruler, we have the famous stone of Tisok. This magnificent round monument depicts the ruler holding by the hair a series of captives symbolizing the conquered cities, each illustrated by its respective glyph. Such a stone was also fashioned for Moctezuma I, but only that of Tisok survives. We have an interesting description of the monolith by the English traveler William Bullock, who in 1822 found it interred in the cathedral square, about a hundred yards from where the Stone of the Sun then rested. It was buried, with only the upper surface exposed to view, apparently with the design of leaving to the people's Im imagination of the sanguinary nature of the rites concerned. I have seen the Indians themselves, as they pass, throw stones at it, and once I saw a boy jump on it, clench his fist, stamp with his foot, and use other gesticulations of the greatest abhorrence. As I had been informed that the sides were covered with, his with historical sculpture, I applied to the clergy for the further permission of having the earth removed from around it, which they not only granted, but moreover had it performed at their own expense. I took casts of the whole. It is 25 feet in circumference and consists of 15 various groups of figures representing the conquests of the warriors of Mexico over different cities, the names of which are written over them. More information is to be acquired from these figures respecting the gaudy costumes of the ancient warriors that can then can be obtained elsewhere. During the time, and it occupied several days, the operation of taking the castes was going on, the populace surrounded the palace, and although they behaved with great order and civility, would frequently express their surprise as to the motives that could induce me to take so much pains in copying these stones, and several wished to be informed whether the English, whom they considered to be non-Christian, worshipped the same gods as the Mexicans did before their conversion. Attitudes and Attitudes to history change in time. 
and now the monument occupies a place of honor in the National Museum of Anthropology. The stone indeed portrays certain conquests as having been made by Tizoc, and it appears that notwithstanding his apparent faint-heartedness, he took the field to suppress a rebellion in Toluca, already conquered by his brother. It is possible also that he made certain conquests in the states of Guerrero and Oaxaca. At all events, his performance failed to, satisf to satisfy these standards expected from a Machica sovereign, and his early death was thus timely for reasons of state. It may even have been artificially hastened. Torquemada supports suggestions that he was murdered, but introduces an element of magic following the tendency in the annals of ancient Mexico to embroider fact with fancy. According to his version, the ruler of Ixtapalapa, for reasons unknown, wanted to kill Tizoc. Not trusting any of his own people to fulfill the task, he persuaded the ruler of Tashko to send some witches. Two or three were dispatched, who bewitched Tizoc as he was coming out of his palace. He returned bleeding copiously from the mouth and died. The immediate causes of his death are not altogether clear, but in view of the godlike role of the Tlatoani, and remembering the awe which Moctezuma II still inspired, even as a captive king, stories of Tisok's assassination should probably be treated with caution. This concludes chapter 5.